Well, good morning once again. Can I have you turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. If you're new with us, welcome. It's good to see you. I'll let you know we are working our way through John's Gospel here at Calvary on Sunday morning. How fast we're working our way through it, that depends on who you talk to. But... Um, at this point in John's Gospel, we are roughly, well, we're back actually less than 12 hours from the cross. The uh, Lord and his disciples have left the upper room and have made their way through the streets of Jerusalem, stopping at the Golden Gate, which at this point they are probably still there. And in the light of the moon, he taught them about the vine and the branches of the chapter 15. There were vine and uh, grape carvings on these golden doors. And in the light of the full moon, Passover time, uh, I believe many others that he used that to teach them that very important uh, lesson that we looked at. And uh, they are still there, but they're probably about ready to cross the Kidron Valley now, and uh, where Jesus will spend the rest of the night on the Mount of Olives uh, in prayer before being arrested and then um, put on trial the next morning. He will be on the cross by 9 o'clock. So he is using this little time he has left with his disciples. Remember now, Judas is gone. Judas is, uh, is uh, working out his betrayal of Christ. And so Jesus and the eleven are together. And um, he has burden for them. He knows that very soon they're going to be taking over the work he had begun. In other words, after he dies on the cross, rises from the dead, and 40 days later, uh, later returns to his father, they would be taking over this incredible work that he had begun. And uh, so he wants to build into them some final lessons before the cross. And um, one of the lessons is he wants to drive, uh, that he wants to drive home to their hearts is the hatred that they would face from the world as they would go into it serving God and preaching the gospel. Now, as we have said, we're looking at verses 18 to 25. And in this passage, the Lord gives them three reasons why the world would hate them so vehemently. And I'll, para I'll paraphrase. First of all, the world hates Christians because we are not of the world. Number two, the world hates Christians because it hates Jesus and we represent him in this world. And then number three, the world hates Christians because it does not know God. Now, We've already looked at the first two. So if you weren't here, you can go online and you could check those out. Uh, again, they are the world hates Christians because we are not of the world. And the world hates Christians because it hates Jesus. And so that brings us to the third reason Jesus said the world would hate us. The world hates Christians because it does not know God. Let's look at verse 20 and 20, verses 20 and 21. He said, Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Guys, everyone born into this world are born descendants of Adam. Adam blew it for all of us in the Garden of Eden. Adam was the federal head of the human race. As he went, so went all of his descendants. So Adam sinned, of course, Eve, but Adam was the federal head. As he sinned, he brought sin into the human race. And um, every person born from Adam, from that time to this, are born into this world as fallen sinners separated from God. Or to use the language of Jesus here in John 15, every person born into this world does not know God. They don't know God. But understand that God wants them to know Him. When I say they don't know Him, I'm not saying that they're not religious. I'm not saying they don't know who He is. They don't know His name. They've never heard of Jesus. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about they don't know Him. And we're going to explore that word in a moment. Uh, but... They, they don't have an intimate relationship with him. That's the idea. They may know who he is, but then again, the Bible says the devil knows who God is. Demons believe in trouble. Okay? We're talking about a relationship through his son. But 
Jesus said that they, the world does not know God. But we know from the scriptures and even from Jesus' own ministry that God wants unbelievers. He wants sinners to know him. And if I can put it this way, has gone out of his way okay, uh, to reveal himself to them, to fallen sinners, so that they would come to know him and be saved. First Timothy 2, 4, God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, the Greek word for know, when Jesus says, you know, in verse 21, you know, basically the world unbelievers don't know God. The Greek word translated know is a word that means to know perceptively or with understanding. Perceptively or with understanding. Sometimes that Greek word is translated seeing. Seeing, because it carries the idea of spiritual perception and understanding. You remember on the morning of Jesus' resurrection, how the word got out that as the women went to the tomb very early to finish preparing Jesus' body for burial, and they found that the stone was rolled away. They looked inside, and they saw a couple of angels, and the angels said to them, uh, Women, what are you doing here? Why do you seek the dead, the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. They ran back to tell the disciples, right? And so uh, Mary stayed, uh, but the other ladies went and got uh, Peter and John. John was a younger man, and so he outran Peter, got to the tomb, but didn't go in. Saw the stone was go rolled away, but didn't go in because it was Passover time. And, you know, you didn't want to come in contact with a tomb. As a Jew, his Jewish upbringing kicked in. You didn't want to touch anything like a tomb or anything, because like, you'd be defiled. You couldn't observe the Passover. So he just stood there looking. And then here comes Peter. He runs up behind, goes right in, right? And if you study John 20, we'll get there, so we'll talk about it. Um, Mary looked in the tomb and she saw. Peter looked in the tomb and he saw. Two different Greek words for Mary and Peter, but both of them were they saw. They saw the scene. They saw the grave clothes laying there and the winding that was wound around Jesus' head laying there. Of course, empty. His body was gone, but they didn't understand what happened. Where then John eventually went in, verse John 20, verse 8. Then the other disciple, John, uh, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. The Greek word used of John and he saw and believed is a word that means to see and understand. In other words, John saw and understood why the tomb was empty. He remembered Jesus' words. He understood Jesus rose from the dead and he believed. He believed. Guys, that's the same Greek word used in John 15, 21, where Jesus said they do not know him who sent me. It doesn't mean that they don't know who God is, right? I mean, Mary and, and Peter knew the tomb was empty. They, they had the facts before them. They didn't comprehend what was going on. These Jewish men had the facts. They grew up in Judaism. Good heavens, they were, they were trained theologians in their faith, right? But Jesus said to them, they do not know God. When he said that, guys, it was an implication by Jesus, which becomes an indictment. And that was that an indictment of the unbelief of the Jewish leadership of Jesus' day. The implication was uh, very uh, something Jesus was communicating, but an implication that became really an indictment uh, of the unbelief of the Jewish leadership. Because Jesus had been ministering to these guys for three and a half years. Scribes, Pharisees, chief priests, and the Sadducees. Um, they didn't know God. Well, why didn't they know God? Because they didn't want to know God. There's a lot of folks that would stop and say, well, what Jesus said they didn't know God, but these are very religious men. How could they not know God? Because a lot of people don't understand. You can know of God, but not really know God, right? I grew up in the Catholic Church. You all know that. I knew of God. I knew who he was. I went to catechism classes. Uh, I had to study my faith to get make my first con my uh, communion and uh, confirmation, right? Uh, as a Catholic, you know what I'm talking about. These were uh, b basically where you were endorsing the faith. You were committing yourself to the Catholic faith. Uh, I knew this, the facts. But for all the years I spent in the Catholic Church and I knew of God, I never knew him personally. I never had invited Jesus into my heart. Why didn't I do that? I didn't know. 
That's what you needed to do. I didn't really know the gospel. I was taught you're born, you get baptized at birth, uh, you get confirmed when you're a little older, and basically that means you're in the faith. I mean, that was it. I didn't realize it was a personal, personal commitment to Christ. And when I finally prayed to receive him into my heart as my Lord and Savior, he came in and I no longer had religion, I had a relationship. And that changed everything. I became a new creation. Now, all you who are here, you understand what I'm talking about, but religious people don't understand that for the most part, right? And so they wouldn't comprehend what Jesus was saying here, but we understand. He was indicting these men. They had religious head knowledge, but they didn't have a living, vital relationship with the Lord through his son. They didn't want that. They rejected Jesus. You know, Jesus said numerous times over the course of his earthly ministry, that the Father had sent him to declare spiritual truth to a world in darkness. Yes, moral and spiritual darkness. But he also said on numerous occasions that the Father had sent the Son, that the Son might reveal the Father to this world. Might reveal him in truth is the idea. Remember how John's Gospel started, chapter 1, and looking at verse 18, where John said, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Now when you read, nobody has seen God at any time, that throws people. And of course, John was talking about the Old Testament period. All right? But in the Old Testament, I mean, you had Jacob wrestled with God. You had Samson, who came face to face with God. Uh, J uh, Jacob wrestled with him, named the place Penuel. Uh, I've seen the face of God and lived. Well, what is that all about? How could John say nobody's ever seen God? What he's talking about is nobody has ever seen God in all his fullness. Sure, God could take human form and interact with people as he did in the Old Testament time. But remember what Moses said to God. Uh, God, I want to see your glory. Remember uh, Exodus uh, 33, 22? Or Exodus 33, 20. I want to see your glory, God. Show me your glory. And God said, what? Moses, I can't show you my glory. You'd be incinerated. Best I can do is hide in the cleft of the rock there. I'll put my hand over you. I'll walk by. After I get past you, I'll take my hand away. You can see my afterglow. Best I can do, son. All right? So nobody has seen God in all of his fullness and glory. We understand that, okay? But... Something else that's implied is that God's invisible, God's spirit, right? God is invisible and therefore cannot be seen with our human physical eyes. And yet Paul the Apostle said of Jesus Christ in Colossians 1.15 that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The word image is a Greek word that was used of an image made by impression as when Caesar's image was stamped on a coin. Paul is telling us that God the Father stamped his image on human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, which meant that Jesus was the exact manifestation of God in human form. Remember, well, let me just say this. This allowed man to see what God was like. God's invisible. But God, the Spirit, God, the invisible God, stamped his image on the person of Jesus Christ. And it, this allowed man to see what God was like. God is spirit again. God is spirit, therefore, the, and therefore is invisible. But through the incarnation, the invisible God became a visible flesh and blood man. Remember in the upper room? Now, they've left the upper room, but um, a short while before John 15, they're in the upper room still. And uh, he's talking about going away and where I'm going, you can't follow me. Not yet, I'll come back for you, and so on and so forth. And uh, at one point, Philip says, well, Lord, can you show us the Father? We'll be satisfied. And Jesus said, Philip, have I been with you so long that you would ask me such a thing? Show us the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. For I and my Father are one, right? Remember in our study of Revelation, when we first started, chapter 1, verse 5, as we studied that verse, we read how that Jesus was 
uh, was the faith on the earth was the faithful witness of God Almighty. He was a faithful witness. Guys, in a court of law, a witness testifies to what they have seen, right? Jesus was in heaven. He saw the Father, of course. He came down the earth, and now he testified to this world what God was really like. The world didn't really understand that. The Jews, they had a warped concept of God. What do you mean? Well, all their years as a nation, for the most part, they lived in apostasy and idolatry. And in that condition, they saw the wrath of God poured out in the nation in numerous ways at various times. This caused them to have a kind of a warped concept of God, that he was a fire-breathing, wrathful, vengeful God that you couldn't get close to because all they ever did was sin pretty much. And that provoked the holiness of God and caused God to judge them in various ways. And so their concept of God was, you know, basically you got to appease God. Bring the sacrifices. Good heavens, we don't want God mad at us. Well, that's a pagan view of God. Pagans believe that about their deities. you got to appease the gods, right? And of course, in the pagan mind, one of the ways you appease the gods was through human sacrifice. Now think about this. we got 2,000 years of Christianity under our belts, right? Think about the pagan world that Jesus invaded and Paul preached to. A world of, that was full of pagans who believed you appeased the gods through various offerings. The ultimate would be human sacrifice. But here's Jesus saying, God so loves you that he doesn't want you to die for him. He sent me to die for you. That was revolutionary. That was absolutely revolutionary. We, we take it for granted because we, we've grown up with that idea. And part of the way Jesus, when he, when he preached, and the way he lived represented the Father. And then the words he spoke, it was all designed to set the record straight. Sure, he came down to die for our sins. Of course he did. That was the main thing. But in the process, he wanted to show people that God was a loving, merciful God. Not this cruel, vindictive God they had come to believe he was, right? And so... Very important. But this is how we fulfill John's opening statement in chapter 1, verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. Well, that's true. Not in all of his fullness, of course. But listen, John is personalizing this. He's pers No one has seen God at any time. But the only begotten Son who is the bosom of the, in the bosom of the Father, he has gotten close to us. He has gotten close to us. He's not a distant deity. God became one of us and walked among us that we might see him up close and personal is the idea. And that's how we declared God really to the people of this world. Let me read it to you out of the NLT second edition. No one has seen, ever seen God, but the one and only Son is himself God and is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Jesus Christ has revealed the invisible God to mankind in a way we could have never come to know or understand him through our own human logic and reason. You understand Christianity is a revealed truth. Now I want to spend the rest of our time this morning on this because the whole idea of the world not knowing God, the world doesn't know God. Is that God's fault? No, by the time we're done you'll see it isn't. It isn't God's fault. But let me start by saying Christianity is a revealed truth. A revelation is something that is made known to us by God. It is something that would be impossible for us to know through our own human logic or intelligence or normal thought processes. It is knowledge that comes to us through divine input. You know, many centuries ago, Job asked the question, Can a man by searching find God? The question was rhetorical. The answer, of course, is no. That Because we can't find God because God is spirit. And we're limited to our physical understanding, our five senses. The Bible says that God is spirit who lives in the spirit realm. Now, 
spirits in the spirit realm can act, interact with us in the physical realm. They can invade the physical realm at will. But we who are physical human beings are trapped in the physical realm. We can't invade the spirit realm now. Listen, there's a lot of folks that would adamantly disagree with me on that. They're, meta, they're metaphysics. They, they're into metaphysics, right? And they believe through certain techniques, and you name them, they're out there. Visualization, uh, transcendental meditation, all kinds of techniques by which a person can, in the physical realm, can invade the spiritual realm and interact with the spirit beings in that realm, who they believe are ascended masters, avatars, uh, spirits of departed uh, souls that lived on the earth and are now in the astral plane just waiting to, uh, to give us uh, wisdom for living our lives, telling us what's going to happen on the earth. And you have all these folks into metaphysics, and uh, you listen to what they're saying, and basically it revolves around how that someday we're all going to become, we're all God right now, all of us are part of the God consciousness, and someday we'll ascend to full Godhood. And you know how that all, you've heard it. I don't have to get into it, right? But uh, that's what's out there. We know that they're not coming in contact with uh, white masters, avatars, uh, brilliant spirits who are, are exist to give us insight to live our lives on the earth. No, these are demons feeding the human race false doctrine. We know the Bible teaches that the spirit realm can invade the natural realm and interact with us. But we can't invade the spirit realm. That, as the Bible says, we are trapped in a box, quote unquote. We call the four dimension the four dimensional physical universe, and there is no way a human being trapped in this box called the four dimensional uh, physical universe can use any technique. I don't care what it is: visualization, transcendental meditation. If you practicing these things long enough they say you can poke a hole in the box climb out and find god that's what they believe look i don't care how much you meditate i don't care how much a person you know uh, assumes the lotus position looks at their navel navel contemplates their navel and says um you can do that until you drop over but no no matter how hard a person tries uh, no matter how sincere they are, they are incapable of reaching beyond the boundaries of the physical, natural realm because they are trapped. We are all trapped here. And therefore, we are incapable of knowing or understanding anything about the supernatural God. Right? I mean, we are trapped in the natural realm. There's no way we can transcend this realm and come to know God who is supernatural. He's in the supernatural realm. One pastor put it well when he said, and I quote, we can't expect the bug in the bottle to understand the little boy that put it there any more than we can expect the natural man with his natural capacities to understand the supernatural God unless that God chose to condescend and reveal himself to man, end quote. And folks, that is exactly what God did. He revealed himself to us. There are two kinds of revelation. The Bible presents two kinds of revelation that God has given to mankind to reveal himself to us. I'll give you these briefly uh, because I don't want to spend a lot of time on the first one. You can look at other studies we've done. We've developed this in more detail. Uh, theologians uh, have labeled two forms of revelation uh, where God has revealed himself to mankind. First of all, it's what they call general revelation. General revelation is made up of two parts, the creation and then the conscience. All right? The creation, they say, is the outward revelation. The conscience is the inward revelation. And uh, I'll just give you two of these that deal with the creation, how God has revealed himself in creation. There's dozens of verses. But uh, Romans 1.20, Paul said, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So God has revealed himself clearly through the creation. 
The psalmist said this in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows forth his handiwork, right? Day in the day utters speech. Night in the night reveals knowledge. And there is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. What is the psalmist saying? The psalmist is saying that the creation speaks a universal language to all people on the face of the planet. That God is real. That God exists. Okay? And, and just, it, it, it's preaching. The creation is preaching the existence of God. But then there's another revelation that God has given to us as human beings under the heading of general revelation, and that's our conscience. Now, I won't read this to you, but you can check out Romans chapter 2, and primarily verses 12 through 16. Let me paraphrase what Paul is saying. Uh, he is proving the existence of God through our conscience. What does that mean? Paul says that God has written in the heart of man... His laws. I'm not just Christians now. Every human being. That God has written in all human beings' hearts His law. And, and give, has given us uh, an alarm system that goes off when we violate one of those laws. It's called our conscience. When you, when you lie or you steal something or you do something God has forbidden. Even unbelievers get guilty. That's the warning siren. It, it takes the form of guilt. But that's our conscience, right? Now, unbelievers can sear their conscience as with a hot iron by ignoring it, ignoring it, ignoring it, till they no longer feel any guilt. And then they can sin at will and not feel the least bit bad about it. But for people who are not that far gone yet, uh, when they, unbelievers now, when they violate, of course, Christians, it affects us too, but I'm talking about unbelievers, even unbelievers who don't know Jesus Christ have God's laws written in their hearts. So when they do something to violate God's laws, their conscience kicks in, the alarm goes off, and the alarm is guilt. They feel guilty. That's God's way of saying, you have crossed the line. Now here's the problem with that, guys, and that is that that indicates that there is a moral God who made us. Evolution doesn't produce morality. Oh, they say it, it does. It doesn't. Uh, it's just instinctive. Uh, you know, it, it's jungle law. Think of animals in the jungle. That's evolution. The, 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 the strong preying on the weak, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's all about, uh, it's all about uh, the, the strong uh, killing the weak to survive, and, and the weak eventually die off, and uh, species evolve into, into higher forms and more hardy and so on. But there's no morality. There's no mercy and compassion in a jungle. It's just survival of the fittest. So where did this innate knowledge of right and wrong come from? Where did this mercy, this compassion uh, come from? It didn't come from evolution, I guarantee you that. It testifies to the existence of a moral God who made us and put it there. And we've talked about this at length in other studies. You can dig those out, right? Now, let me just say this, though. General revelation as powerful as it is, can only go so far in revealing God to a person. I mean, it can prove his existence. We just talked about that. It can give us some general information about him. That he's a God of power. He must be to have created everything. He's also a God of wisdom because everything fits together. Ecosystems coexist and work off each other and are connected and so on, right? Uh, he's also a God of beauty. He must be because the creation, even in its fallen state, we know it's fallen, is still beautiful. And even we can surmise that he is a moral God because of our conscience, right? And as wonderful as that information about him is, it's not enough to save us. It's not enough to save us. So in addition to general revelation, God gave us what the theologians call special revelation. Special revelation. Guys, special revelation is God's revelation of himself in Scripture. It's God's revelation of himself in Scripture. This is where God kind of gets up close and personal. Okay? He introduces himself to us, tells us his name, right? Um, gives us personal information about himself that we could never have learned from creation and conscience. It is also in the pages of Scripture that God tells us about the nature of man his fallen condition, sin, 
righteousness, salvation, and judgment, as well as other important subjects like the first coming, the second coming, the kingdom age, the eternal state, heaven and hell, all spoken to us through special revelation, the pages of Scripture. Old Testament scholar Gleason Archer put it this way, said, and I quote, How then can we know God or his will for our lives? Well, only if he reveals himself to us. Unless he himself tells us, we can never know for sure the answers to those questions which matter most to us as human beings. Yeah, like, how did I get here? What's life all about? And most importantly, what happens to me after I die? Creation can't answer those questions. Our conscience can't. It takes special revelation, God revealing himself, telling us who he is, why he made us, what life is all about, and what happens to us when we die. Archer goes on, at this point it is important to observe that the Bible presents itself as the written revelation of God. This purports to be a book in which God gives us the answers to the great questions which concern our soul in which all the wisdom and science of man are powerless to solve with any degree of certainty, end quote. Absolutely. You know, Francis Schaeffer, the great apologist and Christian philosopher, is with the Lord now, uh, writing about God, years ago wrote, God is he, is, he is there, and he is not silent. So if you have any questions, Schaeffer says, look, God is here, and he is not silent. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1. This is what Schaefer was talking about. Among other places in the Bible. Because the writer to the Hebrews touches on this very subject. All right, Hebrews 1 verse 1. God who at different times and in various ways, look, spoke spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. The fathers would be the Jewish patriarchs. God at different times and in various ways spoke in time past. That would be our Old Testament period. To the Jewish patriarchs by the prophets. That was one way. The Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament revelation, and we can include the New Testament as well because God continued to speak uh, through various prophets and things, uh, but mostly now through the written word, all right, our New Testament. But um, we'll just keep it to the Old Testament because that's what the writer of the Hebrews is talking about. The Old Testament revelation came at different times, he tells us, and in various ways. Guys, Scripture is the progressive revelation of God. It's progressive revelation in the sense that it goes from partial to complete, to God's limited disclosure of himself to a full disclosure of himself to man this side of heaven it's a lot about god we're not going to understand this side of glory so god doesn't even bother remember he said my ways are not your ways as high as the heavens are above the earth my ways are higher than your ways my thoughts and your thoughts i can only give you so much now once we're glorified we see him face to face we'll know a lot more about him at that point but Scripture is God's progressive revelation. He didn't give us everything day one. It was spread out over basically 6,000 years. We're coming to the end of 6,000 years of human history. That's the biblical, not what science teaches, okay? But the word spoke, God at different times in various ways spoke in time past, right? The word spoke in Hebrews 1 verse 1 is the Greek word apocalypto. And it is a word that literally means to unveil something that was previously hidden. And by the way, the book of Revelation is the book of apocalypto. It's the unveiling, where God is unveiling things to our understanding that we didn't really know before he gave us that book, right? And we're having a great time studying it because it really is revealing things that are incredible. Uh, a lot of them future, a lot of them future things. But um, God spoke. He unveiled to us, to our understanding, things that were previously hidden. And guys, that's what revelation is. It's the act by which God makes himself known to us, and without which, without revelation, there could be no knowledge 
of God. Again, one pastor put it well. He said this, and I quote, he said, Here we are on this little planet trapped on earth, bound by time and space, sensing, de sensing deep within ourselves that somewhere out there, there is some kind of intelligent being who created all of this. We call him God, but we haven't got any way to attain any information about him. Satan has told us that there are many roads that will lead us to this God. So man has invented one religion after another in the hopes of reaching God. But these are nothing more than philosophical systems of faith that come from the mind of man. Whereas the Bible says that God at various times and in different ways spoke, end quote. He spoke to us. And of course, the ultimate example of special revelation where God spoke to us through the pages of Scripture. The ultimate example of special revelation that God revealed to man. Special revelation is God revealing something that we never knew before. It's details about himself, right? In special revelation, God revealed to us more completely things about himself than he had ever previously given to us through, you know, general revelation. How did he do it? Well, he gave a special revelation, but there's a way by which he, after giving a special revelation, or part of it, then gives us revelation that went so far beyond the written word up to that point. What was it? The incarnation. The incarnation. We could say with absolute certainty that the culmination of special revelation was the incarnation. The incarnation was the climax the summit, the highest revelation of God to mankind that allowed us to see the invisible God in a way we had never seen him before in all the years of limited revelation he had previously given to us. What was that all about? Well, some of the ways that God had previously revealed himself to us in the past included he spoke through prophets, he spoke through angels, he spoke through visions and dreams, right? As you read the Old Testament, you see God spoke to, to people. Through the prophets, yes, but then directly through dreams, visions. Sometimes he sent an angel to reveal himself or something he was going to do, right? I mean, all of these things were over 4,000 years of Old Testament history were God revealing himself in little bits and pieces. But by far the greatest revelation was the Incarnation. Guys, it was through the Incarnation that God took the revelation of Himself from limited disclosure to full disclosure. It's, the Incarnation is where God literally invaded the box in human form, invaded our four-dimensional physical universe in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. Turn back to Hebrews chapter 1. and Let's read verses 1 and 2 this time. See, God had spoke to us in time past. Well, let's read it. God would, different times and in various ways, spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. That would be the Old Testament. Has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds. So the universe is the idea. So God spoke to the Jewish people in the Old Testament again through prophets and visions dreams angels has in these last days spoken to us by his son jesus christ was the full disclosure of the revelation of god in human form i mean everything and, and, and john says that to open up his gospel he said in the beginning was the word right a title for jesus christ and the word was with god and the word was god he was in the beginning with God. John goes on, All things were made through him, and without him, without Jesus Christ, nothing was made that was made. Verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word that God had spoke 4,000 years to people, or through angels, visions, dreams, that very word became a flesh and blood person where God himself invaded the natural realm, stood among us, got up, up close and personal, personal with uh, us 
speaking of the people back then and then how they related their experiences to us in the scriptures. But God got up close and personal with man. And we saw him as he, we saw the mercy, the love. These guys followed Jesus. They lived with him for three and a half years. Everywhere they go, they saw his compassion for the lost, his love for sinners. People would blow it and they would be devastated. He would put his arms around them and say, I forgive you. I mean, this was God living among us. In fact, Jesus is called Emmanuel, right? Matthew 1, uh, you know, virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel literally means God with us. God with us. It's incredible to think about. So when I say, as Jesus said, when Jesus said, the world at large does not know God. There's no excuse for it. There's no excuse for people not knowing God because God has done everything in his power that people might know him. The only way a person does not know God is because they choose not to know God. That's the crux of the issue. That's what Jesus was keying in on in our text this morning. Verse 21. The world doesn't know God. Well, why doesn't the world know God? God's revealed himself all over the place, so why don't people know God? Because they don't want to know God. Or they think they already do know God. Why? Because they go to church. And they practice religion. And they light the candles. And they pray the rosaries. And they do the stations of the cross in the Catholic Church like I did. Every day at lunchtime when I went to school there. I thought I knew God too. Again, I had religion. I didn't have a relationship. I didn't have a personal relationship with him. So a lot of people, they just... They don't know guys. They choose not to know God. And in that case, guys, the revelation of God given to man, if rejected or ignored, will not save them, but listen, only serve then to condemn them. Turn back to Romans as we bring this to a close. Chapter 1. And I just want to read to you Again, what Paul says, you can read the whole chapter. It's definitely worth your time. But Romans chapter 1, starting with verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their desire to live unrighteously. That's why God is angry with this world. That's why God is going to judge the unbelieving people of this world. Because he has gone out of his way to reveal himself to them, but because they want to live in sin, they don't want to really honor God with their lives, that they ignore God, they reject God, they write him off, and therefore God is going to bring wrath, his judgment against them, verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, the visible outward creation, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Don't ever forget that. Oh, how can a God of love send people to hell? A God of love has done everything in his power to get you to come to heaven. If you reject God, if you reject his son and his word and all that, and you wind up going to hell, it will be your fault, not his. You know, we often think that a person doesn't believe in God because they lack the information. Okay, That's where we come in. And if we can only give them, read the right apologetic book or books, write down a few notes, because that's what they need. They need the information. If we can just give them the information they're lacking, voila, they're going to have to get saved. We think that. But in reality, the truth is that often the problem isn't in their head, it's in their heart. Psalm 14, 1, the fool has said where? In his heart there is no God. They willfully reject the knowledge they have about God. General revelation, special, they've rejected it. It's not a matter of not having the information. It's like the devil and his demons. They got all the information. In fact, they saw it firsthand. Jesus being born of a virgin. 
growing up, living, conducting his ministry, going to the cross, rising from the third day, uh, the third day from the they saw it all. But you know, the devil, you know, well, he and his angels, they they can't be converted. Once it's an angel, if you blow it once, you blow it forever. But my point is. There are people that have grown up in church. They they know the facts, okay? They know the gospel. They went to Awanas or or Sunday school or a church summer camp where they were Christian summer camp. It's not that they don't have the information. It's they refuse to let the information bring them to Jesus, right? They willfully reject the knowledge God has given them. And the reason... So many refuse to commit themselves to believing in God is because, listen, then they would have to acknowledge God's existence, which means if you believe God created you, you would be subject to that God. You would have to to then submit your life to him. And that is something they just cannot bear the thought of doing. I heard an atheist one time on Christian radio. He was being interviewed. God bless the guy. He He came in for an interview, okay, on Christian radio. And and the and the, the person asked a very basic question. Um, why why are you an atheist? Why don't you believe in God? And he said, Because if I believed in God, then I'd have to live for that God, and I don't want to do that. I want to live my life for me. I thought, wow, that's an honest atheist. <laughs> Most of them don't even acknowledge that. That's exactly what is going on, right? And um, they they can't hold the thought. But so they either have to do away with God altogether, that's atheism, or recreate for themselves a God who is consistent with the way they want to live, a God who is supportive of their lifestyle choices. That's called idolatry, by the way, right? To create a God in your own image and after your own likeness, that's called idolatry. Look, and we're done. For the person who wants to live in sin, they really only have two choices. To believe in God and live with the guilt. That's your conscience kicking in, right? So believe in God and live with the guilt of disobedience. But you know what? That feels kind of lousy. Walking around with all that guilt. Okay? The more popular way today to do it, a lot of young people have done this, is just to do away with God altogether. Kill God. Do away with God. No God, no guilt. Right? You would be shocked at how many young people Millennials and others who are atheists. Neo-atheism is exploding. Why? Because we have a generation that wants to do its own thing. Has grown up pretty much in a pagan culture. Uh, Even when I was a kid, my parents took me to church. They weren't even believers. But families went to church on Sunday. You know, and and people had a lot of respect for, uh, for the church and the Bible and so on. But these kids have grown up with none of that. They've pretty much grown up in a pagan culture, and they are atheists because they want to do what they want to do. They want to live their own lives. However, as I just said, it's, it's not that easy to kill God. You know, Wasn't it Nietzsche who said, God is dead? The famous atheistic philosopher, God is dead, right? Somebody said they saw in a bathroom stall somewhere, uh, you know, God is dead, sign Nietzsche. Somebody wrote under it. Nietzsche is dead, sign God. So, you know, <laughs> you know, but it's not easy rejecting God, the existence of God. Because you got those two pesky witnesses whispering in your ear, the, the creation and the conscience. But, you, I mean, you know, you can, if you try hard enough, you can suppress the truth. I was telling first service. As Paul said that, right? They suppress the truth in their desire to live unrighteously. Have you ever taken a beach ball? and try to push it under the water. That takes a lot of energy to keep it under the water. You move a little bit, boom, pops right up. That's, that's man working so hard to keep God, the knowledge of God suppressed. But at every turn, pop, he pops up. Here I am. What are you going to do about me? You know? All right, one final point, we'll close. Yes, the Bible says, the fool says in their heart, there is no God. That's true. You know who I think is the greater fool? The person who does believe in God, but then lives like there is no God. And there are a lot of people who are religious unbelievers. Again, they grew up in church. They went to Awanas, Bible camp, whatever. They do believe in God. They they believe Jesus Christ 
died for their sins, rose again from the dead. They probably believe he's the only way to heaven. They were taught that in church. They know the gospel. But they've never committed their life to Christ. They got the head now, just never become a heart conviction where they invited Jesus in. And so why are they the bigger fool? Because the Bible says with knowledge comes responsibility. The atheist is going to go to hell, but the punishment they're going to receive in hell is going to pale by comparison with the person who has believed in God all their life, knew the Bible, but then didn't live for God at all, rejected it, or didn't ignore it. Jesus said, talking about hell, it's a place where a servant that did not know his master's will will be beaten with a few stripes, but the person who did know his master's will will be beaten with many stripes. There are degrees of punishment in hell. Didn't Jesus say it would be better off? I forgot what uh, group he was talking about. Maybe um, uh, those who live in the Bethsaida, Capernaum, I forgot. It would be better for them if they had never been born than to know the truth and not live it. Wow. So God give us grace to realize there's a lot of folks out there who really, maybe in our family, who believe that they have a, they're right with God because they know who he is. And they don't. Pray for them. Pray that God opens their eyes. They want to live for their world. They're like the prodigal son, right? All right, well, what are you going to do? Chain your child when they're old enough to what? The doorpost of their bed or uh, of their room or whatever? At one point, they're adults, you have to let them go. and Pray for them like crazy. Because like the prodigal, they're going to go out there thinking they're going to have, oh, freedom. Oh, this is really living. I can do whatever I want. They come to realize after a while that life can be hard. Life can beat you up pretty much. And hopefully that, that God will let life beat them up to the point where they recognize, you know what? This is not the life I thought it was going to be. The only time I ever had peace in my life was when I was in church with other Christians, my family. So pray for your unbelieving loved ones. The world does not know God. That's not God's fault. He loves them. It wants to make himself known to them. They have to be willing. Our prayers are used by God to soften their hearts, make them more open. Keep praying. Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask you, Lord, to continue to bless our studies in your word. And right now, Lord, based on what we have studied this morning, we pray that you would give us grace to be a light in the darkness, Lord, to reveal to people what God is like through our lives. Lord, we pray that the Word would become flesh in us, that our lives would epitomize the teachings of Jesus, the life of Jesus, that when we go out into the world, they see Jesus in us, that we would reveal to them in a special way how much you are real and you do love them. And how much you've transformed our lives. Some of us alcoholics, drug addicts. Lives were broken, shattered. We were contemplating suicide. But then somebody introduced us to Jesus. We accepted you. And you made us new creations. Hey, the world can argue with our doctrine. They can't argue with a changed life. Lord, give us grace to be a light in the darkness. We just pray that you would keep blessing now our studies in your word. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.